Welcome to Sunday Night Crime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's program. Before we get into it, let me remind you, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions for programs, please send your emails to sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. Well, today's program is based on your comments and responding to your questions and comments. Okay, we have a question here today from Joan, who's from Florida, and she writes this. She said, my question concerns what the church calls the dark night and whether this dark night, which she has in quotes, can be equated to a person becoming depressed or frightened about the things of life. Could you explain how faith and the dark night are related? A very good question, Joan, and I uh, tried to prepare this to give you a very uh, good answer, as full as we could, because your question actually can apply the idea of the dark night in three different ways. Okay, first of all, we can look at the dark night as Satan and the kingdom of darkness which we know is the kingdom of evil. And he, is, uh, he goes about as a roaring lion seeking to destroy souls, to lead them astray, lead them to hell, uh, which you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. second, second meaning uh, for dark night would be darkness as, in terms of a period or an experience of um, trial, such as the examples you gave, Joan, in your question there. You said people becoming depressed or frightened about the things of life. Well, those can be uh, an experience of a kind of darkness, not necessarily a physical, but emotional, spiritual darkness. And that's very important. Or dark night uh, can also be understood in the technical way that we use that phrase in spiritual theology about an experience that people go through in their growth in prayer. It's a very important but yet painful experience for people to have. But if you want to grow to the higher stages of prayer where you're closer to God, more faithful to Him, um, joyful in carrying out what God is asking of you, you need to go through that dark night experience. It isn't easy and it's always best to have a kind of spiritual guide, a spiritual director, to sort of help you through it. We'll say a little bit about each of these experiences so that we can try to cover your question. You know, in Scripture, we find a lot of what we might call contrasts. Jewish people like to uh, use contrast to illustrate an idea. We do the same thing, high and low and uh, cold and hot and so on like that. It can be used in different ways. Well, you'll find contrasts in Scripture between good and evil. And um, um, certainly, and you know, in the teachings of Christ, uh, later on, St. Paul, he spoke about what was good, but he also warned against that which was evil. You remember when he talked, for example, uh, in one of his letters to the Galatians, the, the letter to the Galatians, where he talked about the fruits of, of the uh, Spirit and the fruits of the flesh, you know, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Um, what we bring forth, love, peace, joy. And then, of course, the fruits of the flesh, you know, uh, fornication, adultery, uh, anger, hatred, and all of the like. So there was a contrast there. Another contrast we, we hear a lot in Scripture is between life and death. Remember, even in the Old Testament, when Joshua spoke to the people, uh, you know, he was ready to lead them into the Holy Land. And... Um, he said I, he, he kind of renewed the uh, promise the people had made at the covenant to accept Yahweh as their God and th that they would keep the commandments. So he said to them, at the, in essence, he said, I set before you life and death, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a reward or punishment. Mm -hmm. So life and death is a contrast. The flesh and the spirit. You know, St. Paul speaks about that. Even our blessed Lord, when he spoke to Nicodemus, when he said, what is flesh is flesh, what is spirit is spirit. Huh? And um, so 
using contrast is important. But the one of light versus darkness, that's the one, Joan, that was in your question. And so we can, we can look at that question in terms of the struggle that we see between light and darkness. Light becomes, this, in Scripture, a symbol for God and of His kingdom. Remember, uh, we need light to see beauty, uh, to see order, to see goodness in creation. If we didn't have any light, we couldn't see anything. Right? Remember that. Without light, you know, we can't see. There's total darkness. So, in order to see the beauty and the goodness, the order of creation, how God cares for His creatures, how beautiful they are, um, uh, we, need, we need light. And so, um, light was the first thing that God created. Let me read that to you. This is going all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. First verses in Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 1 up to verse 5. Let me read to you. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening and morning came the first day. So we see that um, the abyss, the primal abyss, you know, at the very beginning of creation was covered in darkness. And the first thing God created then was light to dispel that darkness, to separate day and night. Okay, something very important. So light was God's gift, his first gift to his creation. Um, our Lord identifies himself, doesn't he, as the light of the world in John uh, chapter 8 verses 12. Uh, Jesus said that he was the light of the world and that if we follow him, we will always walk in the light. We certainly don't want to walk in the darkness, the confusion, and the uh, sins of the world, okay? That was uh, just a reference to that phrase where Jesus said, I am the light of the world and anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness, will walk in the light. John chapter 8 verse 12, okay? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also said to his uh, listeners, and especially his apostles were there, he said to them, you are the light of the world. So not only is Jesus personally the light of the world, but those who follow him are the light of the world. And he said, you know, when people light a lamp, they don't put it under a, a bed, they put it on a lampstand where the light of that lamp will give light to the whole room. It lights up the whole entire room. And he said, that's the way you are the light of the world. He said, you must let your light shine before others, okay, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father uh, in heaven, okay? And uh, we know that uh, that certainly is very, very important. So we always understand that reference when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, uh, to the role of the church. The church has to be a light in the world, okay? Um, uh, it light in, lights up the world, okay? And, uh, and helps others to find their way to the truth, to the true God. So, you know, St. Bonaventure, who was a doctor of the church, a great Franciscan uh, theologian, used this comparison. He said, Jesus is like the sun. The church is like the moon. And then you've got the world. He said, the sun gives light of itself. Jesus is the source of light. The, the, the moon, just like the moon receives the light of the sun and reflects it into the world, so the church receives the light of Christ and reflects that light into the world. And that's why Jesus could say to the apostles, you are the light of the world. We receive Christ's light. If we have any other light, it'd be a distortion. It would be really darkness, wouldn't it? Something in conflict with Jesus. So all truth must be in harmony with Jesus because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And the only way for the truth of Jesus, the light of Jesus, to get in the world is for us to reflect that light. Remember, he also used, by the way, that reference there was uh, chapter 5. Let me read that in Matthew's Gospel 
in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 5. I'm going to begin with verse uh, 14 here. <clears throat> He actually uses another analogy, which I'll include here, which is verse 13, okay? Uh, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Hmm? Uh, you are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Okay, so we have to uh, be that light of Christ. We, our lives should reflect the virtues that Jesus teaches us, the truths that we are to live by, and then we will be truly a light. By the way, that idea of salt adds another little element. Remember, in ancient times, uh, salt was used uh, for two reasons. One, that we still use it today, and that is to season food, you know, brings out the nice flavors when you put salt. Otherwise, you got a kind of dull food if there's no salt to it. Huh? I mean, <laughs> asked Padre Fio one time what his youth growing up was like. He said, I was like a piece of spaghetti with no salt on it. It meant uh, quite dull. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and then uh, he, uh, uh, not he, but uh, our Lord, you know, is telling us that as salt of the earth, we also have to preserve. Remember in ancient times, without refrigeration, most of their foods, they, if they were perishable foods, many of them were preserved by salting them down, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, even a fish called bacala, that's uh, the way they preserve it even to this day. They salt it heavily and you have to, before you cook it, you have to take the, let the salt come out, okay? So we have to be those who will preserve the teaching of Christ and make it attractive, like the salt makes food delicious, okay? So we are the light of the world. We are called to be the salt of the earth, and that's the role of the church. Now, Jesus doesn't mean for us to draw all attention to ourselves. No, we don't want to do that. That would be pride and vanity, okay? Uh, but it's as a church as a whole, uh, you know, Jesus wants the light of this church to be seen throughout the world. So light then is a symbol of knowledge, understanding, and uh, Joan, it's also the light of faith. And that, I think, is what part of your question was kind of asking. Uh, what could you explain how faith and the dark night are related? So when we have the light of Christ, faith becomes like a vision in darkness. Okay, uh, you know, uh, p there, are, there are instruments today where people can actually see in the dark. I know the military uses them to uh, observe any enemy movements in time of war. They can actually see the enemy with, the, with this equipment in the darkness. And so faith is like a vision in the darkness that even though we don't see, we don't sense God, we believe. We trust that he's there and he's working in us. Okay. Just people, people who are sincere, they love the light. They want to stand in the light so that they can see that their, that their deeds are good. Okay? Now, darkness, on the other hand, is a symbol of chaos. Remember, we heard that that primeval chaos or abyss lay under darkness, so God created the light to drive that darkness away. But darkness brings evil, disorder. And so the kingdom of Satan is referred to as a darkness. Okay, there's sin, there's evil there in his kingdom. And people who are insincere, people who are sinners, they love darkness. That's why thieves come out at night. They usually don't like to be seen during the day robbing. Huh? They come at night when nobody is around or everybody's asleep so that they can carry out their evil deeds unseen. And that's what darkness is, okay? Um, and people who are insincere, people who are sinners, do not like the light. Jesus said that the Gospel of St. John, um, where he, he said they prefer the darkness because otherwise the light would expose their evil, their deceit, whatever wrong they are doing. 
Well, you know what? We're going to take a break right now, but we're going to come right back and just say a few more things about the struggle between light and darkness. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Sunday Night Time. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, which is entitled Responding to Your Questions and Comments. We've been looking at a question from Joan about the dark night. We've been discussing in the first part of the program the, how light becomes a symbol of God and his kingdom and darkness becomes a symbol of uh, Satan and his kingdom. So the contrast there between good and evil light and darkness. And so we're all caught up in this struggle. Um, and, and it's very important for us to realize, you know. And in the beginning of his gospel, St. John in the prologue, that's chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Okay, he has a very interesting way that he puts this struggle. Okay, and uh, just like to, to touch on this here. So it's chapter 1, and that was verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> St. John tells us, he's talking about the Word. Remember, the Word was with God. God the Father and His Word, who is the second divine person, the Son of God, who becomes man. It was Jesus Christ as God and man. Okay, verse 4. Um, what came to be through Him, through the Word, was life. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, very important statement there, huh? where St. John tells us then that Jesus, you know, becoming man, he now, as we saw already, said, I am the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness. Okay, so he came, and this light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. What does that mean, did not overcome it? Some uh, people who interpreted this felt it meant they didn't understand the word, okay? Oh, they didn't understand the light. They wouldn't, ex therefore, they didn't accept the light. They sort of neglected it because it didn't seem important. I don't think that's the main re understanding. Others said it meant that they didn't welcome the light. They understood what it meant, but they didn't, wanted. They didn't want any part of it. So they just neglected it. Even that I don't think is the main understanding there. But there was a third understanding and that is those who not only did not accept the light, didn't welcome it, but tried to destroy it. Okay? And this struggle then between light and darkness, you know, between the forces of the kingdom of God and the forces of the kingdom of Satan is going on. It's it's um, going to go on till the end of the world hmm? because uh, Jesus cannot compromise with evil and evil will not compromise with Jesus. Hmm? It's conflict between, you know, between uh, good and evil. Pope St. John Paul II said there was a conflict between the church and the anti-church. Now there's all the forces that would be against the church, line up against the church because they have rejected Christ. It's a, he said it's a conflict between the gospel and the anti-gospel. And how often there are distortions of the, the teachings of Christ, especially in our society today. We see our society was built on the Judeo-Christian values, the value of life, for example, that every life is sacred and has a dignity from the moment of conception to natural death. And... Um, and so uh, there is a struggle here between the gospel and the anti-gospel. Um, other values, not only of life, but freedom, the dignity of marriage, something as sacred, you know, established by God from the very beginning when he created them male and female. Uh, and so uh, these struggle, this struggle between light and darkness 
is going on. And Pope uh, John Paul II said it was a struggle between Christ and the Antichrist. And we know from St. John's first letter, he said the Antichrist is in the world already. So the forces that are against Jesus, Satan certainly behind it all, and uh, we must do our best to resist this and uh, to proclaim Christ anew. You know, um, Pope St. John Paul II said we are intensely going through this struggle right now. He said it's the most, the most intense spiritual struggle of the church's 2,000 year history. And what's at stake, he said, is the entire Christian culture. We, we referred to some of that already when we talked about the dignity of human life, um, the dignity of marriage, the dignity of sexual distinction between male and female, uh, the, the dignity and uh, importance of religious freedom. All of these are values that are engaged in this enormous struggle between the forces of light, God himself, and the forces of evil, Satan and his kingdom. Okay, now this ties in with Joan's question because the struggles uh, between light and darkness can happen on various levels, okay? There can, they could be tr struggles over truth, they could be struggles over justice, they could be struggles over honesty and so on. But they can happen, first of all, on a personal level where the individual is going through part of this struggle within themselves, okay? It could happen within a family or a community, um, whatever that community may be, a religious community, a, a community of religious men or women or perhaps even a, a parish and so on. It, the church universal goes through struggles, persecution, which she endures in so many places in the world today. And finally, um, the struggle between light and darkness, goodness and evil, can happen even on a worldwide scale, which um, you know, can, can happen where there is persecution for the values that God has revealed as, you know, as he uh, wants these values to be accepted within his uh, kingdom. Um, Joan, the examples that you give of a person suffering from depression or fright uh, seem to provide an example of someone experiencing this on a personal level, okay? Um, and you were asking in your, your question, uh, let me go back to that because it's uh, interesting. Can this struggle of dark and, and darkness and, and light, this dark night, be equated to a person becoming depressed or frightened about the things of life, things that are happening. Um, how can we, how uh, could you exp explain how faith and the dark night are related? Well, a very important thing, uh, very important uh, question to ask because they are related, certainly. For example, now some sufferings, some of our sufferings are caused by human weakness or deprivation. So, for example, if we give in to fears, a lot of times that's due to our human weakness. Uh, or we've not been taught certain things, that, so we're deprived in that sense. And these, um, these can lead to moments of discouragement and, uh, and the like. So, and then what happens is the devil comes along and he tries to stir them up, tries to intensify the natural difficulties we have that are part of everyday life in, in people's lives on a personal level. Not to say that they don't also occur on a family level, community level, that they don't occur within the church or um, in major parts of the world. As we see today with violence in so many places on a worldwide scale. Uh, so. Uh, the devil, I'm sure, intensifies or tries to intensify all of this evil, stirring it up. And um, then some of our problems come from inordinate attachments. So for example, somebody who is inordinately attached to money, you know, may go and gamble away all the money they need for their support, their livelihood, maybe their family, their, their wife, their husband, their children, and they, you know, just gamble it all away thinking nothing of that, and then they find themselves in difficulty, you know, um, or maybe uh, over addiction to food or to pleasure, 
you know, different pleasures which can easily lead a person to abuse, particularly uh, sexual pleasures, attachments there that lead people to the use of pornography and lead to other personal sins and uh, sins with other people, uh, you know, of, of a sexual nature. So, um, and then maybe a person can be inordinately attached to friends. For example, jealousy can get in there, you know, and, and people do some strange things because of jealousy. You know, they may be jealous of a person who's trying to, or who seems like they're taking one of their friends away from them, so they get jealous of that person who's doing that. And uh, they, uh, they want to keep that person for themselves. That's the jealousy. I'm jealous of my friend, and I don't want anybody else to take them. You know, God is jealous, right? He says that in the first commandment. I am the Lord your God, and you shall not have strange gods before me. So that's pretty important that we love God first. And, and so uh, all of these can be areas which will lead us into um, sins or, you know, to, to have conflicts on a personal level, or it can go even beyond that, okay? How about a lack of trust in God? You know, when people, uh, they don't recognize his goodness. They don't see how God wants to uh, bestow his mercy, his love on the world. They, they forget about his love. They forget about his divine providence, how he is always at work wanting to take care of us, okay? So maybe a lack of trust there. Uh, is that directly due to darkness? Could be. The devil may certainly um, inf try to inflict on them a feeling of discouragement, a feeling of being abandoned by God. He, he's, he is the deceiver. That's his title, right? And he deceived our first parents and getting them to go against God's commandment by telling them if they ate the fruit, they'd be just like God himself. And it ended up that they became less like God himself. Huh? So um, that's why it's very important then, you know, to uh, make sure we don't have attachments that make us do things, you know, that would be wrong. We don't want to be acting in the way of darkness, but rather put on the light, huh? St. Paul told that to some of his early convert, converts. He said, you once were darkness, but now you have put off that darkness. Walk in the light. Remember the letter to the Romans. He said, make no provision for the deeds of the flesh. You know, put off the darkness and put on the light. Put on Christ. He's the light. Um, maybe uh, we can also have, uh, some people have a rigid need to control everything in their lives, which is very, very, almost impossible so we have to learn how to trust, you know? Uh, and again, people with narcissism who are very narcissistic, um, very dis disordered in their love, you know? Everything has to center around themselves, self-love. Uh, you know, that's very, very important that an individual learns how to, um, to turn to God and, and, and trust their life to his care, his, his providence, you know? We easily set ourselves up uh, for hurt, for disappointment. And what happens oftentimes along comes anger, resentments, and all of these things which really take away our peace. You know, they leave us with no happiness in life. Huh? And so it's very, very important that we, we try to grow in our, um, our, our trust in God and our desire to want to please him. So that's important. A part of the, that trust in God is when we recognize our limitations, but we recognize that God is a loving Father. Didn't Jesus teach us that in the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about how God the Father takes care of the birds of the air? They don't sow in the field like farmers do, uh, but they still have food. They... Uh, the, the, lily, the lilies, the plants don't sew, sew any cloth or, you know, uh, weave any cloth. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them, Jesus said. So we should look to nature. And he said, we're more important than any uh, flock of uh, sparrows or, you know, a whole lot of lilies. We are much more important than that. And so that's why we have to learn how to have real trust in God. Um, 
it's kind of like the beautiful prayer uh, that we call the serenity prayer. Huh? Uh, we had uh, Father Jonathan Morris uh, on the program a few weeks ago, and he wrote a book on that serenity prayer. And you remember that beautiful prayer goes this way. God, give me this, the patience or the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, very, very important. So God, give me the patience to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, we've got to stop here at this moment, but we'll be right back. We've got a whole other part of the program to go. So please don't leave us. Sunday Night Crime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, uh, which is entitled Responding to Your Questions and Comments. And we've been looking at a question from Joan. Uh, let me repeat that question now in this last part of our program. My question concerns what the church calls the dark night and whether this dark night, in quotes, can be equated to a person becoming depressed or frightened about the things of life. Could you explain how faith and the dark night are related? Well, we've looked so far at the conflict between uh, the kingdom of light, which is the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of Satan. That battle is going on and will go on to the very end of the world until Christ comes again and he will destroy the kingdom of Satan and um, he will draw into the kingdom of heaven those who have been faithful to him. So that's a struggle that we're all involved in, you know, in our uh, living out of our uh, daily lives, our, our Christian values, to follow Christ, uh, to come to eternal life. But we also looked at a second way of looking at that question, and that is the personal struggles that we may have. Because this, this battle between good, good and evil, between light and darkness, happens on a personal level, such as the examples that, uh, that Joan gave between a person who is suffering from uh, fright or depression. Could that be part of the struggle? Yes. Come, some of those problems come from our own weakness, but they become part of the struggle that we have to remain faithful to Christ. The Lord will help us to deal with these things, and we looked at several of them uh, in the last, program, last part of the program as just before we uh, took our break, okay? But we come to the third part when I had told, mentioned at the beginning of the show that there were three ways of looking at this dark night. And one of them is technical. See, the phrase dark night is a phrase that's found in a lot of the writings um, by certain saints and writers of the spiritual life. When they describe a growth in holiness. We're all on a spiritual journey, and this journey will bring us to the kingdom of heaven, but at the same time, it's a journey to grow in holiness, personal holiness in our daily lives. And some of the great writers on prayer have told us that in the course of our journey, if we get far enough, we will go through at least one, if not two, experiences that they call dark night. And that's what I'd like to look at now in this third part of the program because this is very technical. You see, um, St. John of the Cross is the one who speaks about the dark night of the soul. Okay, what he means by that is, is a reference to two separate experiences where a person goes through what might be called a spiritual darkness because they, are, uh, they, they kind of find themselves not understanding what's going on in their life. You know, 
They were moving along in their spiritual journey and all of a sudden, very abruptly, they seemed to have lost contact with the Lord. He seems to have gone away or doesn't care for them anymore. At least that's the experience that they have personally. And, um, and, and they don't know their way. They can't pray and so on. So what I thought I'd do is just give a few ideas here. What, what are these dark nights and why do we go through them? Okay, they are important, painful as they are, especially the first one, which is the dark night called the dark night of the senses. All right, that a lot of people will go through that and may not know what they're experiencing. The second dark night called the dark night of the spirit, that's much further on in the spiritual journey. And most people don't reach that far in this life. You have to be really very, very generous and faithful to God. Although God does call us, all of us, to the experience of loving him completely in this life. Okay? See, the way St. Teresa of Avila describes the spiritual life, the journey, she had a vision in which she saw a soul with seven grades of light, beginning with the more faint grades of light, you know, working to a center where the Lord was present. It got more intense as you got closer to the center where the Lord was. And she took that as an inspiration from God to write about the spiritual life in terms of a journey. Okay, she called it the interior castle. Some castles abounded in Spain in her day. Okay, so it was a great castle and made up of what she called seven dwelling places. Usually you'll hear the word mansions. But mansions is a little bit different than I think what St. Teresa had in mind because a mansion is a separate building, usually a separate building, great, big, beautiful building, nonetheless, but separate, where she has this idea of one castle with all of these rooms that are interconnected and you go from one to the other, you know, as you journey. It happens naturally, just like in our human life, our natural life, we go through the experience uh, first of infancy and childhood, then we go into adolescence, and then finally we get to adulthood where we can distinguish young adult, middle-aged, and senior adult, okay? And after that, the Lord calls us. So in the spiritual life, we go through these seven stages, okay, which St. Teresa describes very beautifully, all right? Now, in the beginning, you know, here's just a few little pointers that we'd have to say before we can explain what the dark night is. When a person converts to God, you know, at the beginning of their conversion, many people usually have uh, a lot of habits in their life that are sinful or at least attachments to sinful things. Remember, we call them occasions of sin. Any person, place, or thing that would ordinarily lead you into sin is an occasion of sin. And people who have conversion, some people, you know, their conversion is very difficult. And even though they turn to God, and they, St. Teresa would say, they enter the castle, they have to cross the moat. Well, when they cross the moat, many of their sinful habits, many of their sinful attachments, worldly ways of thinking and acting, follow them. And so it becomes a very important part of their experience that through prayer and through the practice of virtue, they begin to free their heart from attachments to these sinful things. The more they do, the more they are free to advance further, to love God more faithfully, and uh, to uh, honor Him, to grow in virtue, um, and help others. They learn how to be more charitable, more generous with their time, okay? It doesn't come automatically in the beginning unless a person has a real powerful conversion. Remember the woman in the gospel who wept over the feet of Jesus? She, she, she washed his feet with her tears. She dried his feet with her hair. She kissed his feet. She anointed him with the oil. Hmm? That woman, Jesus said of her, when the Pharisee was condemning that woman in, her, in his mind, remember he said, he said that that woman, her sins, many though they are, are forgiven her because she has loved much. Now, I'll bet that that, that woman 
you know, she must have thought about what she was going to do. She must have really experienced such a deep sorrow for her to do these little acts of kindness for Christ, which were so humbling. She was acknowledging her sins, you know, and I'll bet she had very little attachment to them left after that conversion. She probably advanced quickly. I always say some people advance, you know, on roller skates and some people on a 747. She was on a 747 making great progress, okay? Most of us don't, okay? So we struggle to practice the virtues, and that's why we pray. We pray so that God will give us the strength, you see? And as we go on, our motive of loving God changes, you know. A lot of people, some people convert in the beginning because they're afraid of going to hell. That's really a part of their own self-love, but it might get them to turn away from sin, and that's good. You don't want to be lost, so it's better to turn to God because you're afraid of hell than not to turn to Him at all and end up there, see? So St. Saint, Saint Bernard called that a servile love, servile, a carnal love, actually, but it's a servile fear. Mm -hmm. But as we advance, most people begin to love God because they know they need Him. And St. Bernard called that a mercenary love. In other words, uh, what's in it for me? Uh, in other words, I go to God because I need Him. But you see, if you remain at that level of love, you're going to, your service and love of God is going to be very inconsistent. You're going to be hot and cold. Why? Because sometimes you're more keen in how much you need Him, and other times you figure, I don't need Him, so I don't give Him much uh, response. I don't serve Him faithfully. See, you have to move beyond need. You've got to bring your relationship to God based on loving Him because he is all good and he is deserving of all our love. When you reach that level of motivation to love God because he's all good and he's worthy of all my love, you have reached the level of love St. Bernard called filial love. From the Latin word filius, which is son, and filia, which is daughter. Okay, so in other words, filial love of God is the love of one who loves God as a child of God. God is my loving Father. Therefore, He's all good. He's worthy of all my love. And as a loving child, I will love Him. So I'm loving God for His sake, not so much loving God anymore for my sake. And that's a big step. He said, St. Bernard said there's one more stage of love which is characteristic of the saints in heaven. They love God so completely they forget about themselves, okay? Um, but if we could reach that filial love, that's very important. Now, what happens is your prayer begins to change also. It's just like a young couple when they get to know one another. They go through a period of courtship. You know, in the beginning they have to find out. They talk a lot about their background, their interests, and so on. They get to know about one another in general. Then they begin to talk about common concerns and maybe plans for their future, that they might want to get married, you see. And uh, then finally, you know, knowing a lot about each other's family, the things that they like and don't like, and what their hopes are, and, uh, and so on, what their cares and their needs are, they're sh sharing very deeply, more personally, more intimately. So that's a very important step, to come to that kind of relationship, you know, in relationship to other people, especially if you're gonna marry this person, if it's a courtship, okay? Well, the same thing happens with God, all right? In the beginning, people have to use other people's prayers to talk to God because they don't know what to say. We call that formal prayer or the prayer of the lips. And that's why we teach little children to say their prayers. Jesus even taught the apostles who were grown men. You know, when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, he taught them the Our Father, a formal prayer. He knew by saying that over and over, it would, it would help them grow in their, in their heart. They would know more and more how to speak to God. Okay? Then you move from that prayer of the, uh, the lips to the prayer of the mind. You begin to meditate and reflect about the stories of Jesus in the gospel. The mysteries of the rosary are all stories from the gospel, you see? And so we, uh, we want to know more about Jesus. We think about him. And, um, and so we meditate, we reflect. And finally, the more, the closer you come to God, eventually you learn to speak from your heart. In other words, it's sort of a personal heart-to-heart -heart conversation with someone you love. That's exactly how St. Teresa of Avila said, 
because she, that's not exactly the way she described what prayer was. She said, it's nothing but a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God by whom we know we're loved. Now, to go through that process, okay, prayer, but also the virtues, you know, you've got to get rid of sin and attachment to sin. You've got to be practicing the virtues, the doing good and faith, hope, and charity, okay? Sometimes it happens that a person reaches a certain point where God wants to bring them further. And all of a sudden, the people who have been praying, many times they experience a beautiful gift that we call consolation. They feel close to God. They feel comfortable in meditating, you know, and um, they're loving God. And all of a sudden, what happens? It all changes. The Lord seems to be abruptly taken away from them. And they go into a panic. Hmm? That's the dark night of the senses, see? See, God, God wants to lead that person further. It's actually a sign of God's love for that person to lead them through this. We don't look at it that way. We feel pain. What happened? I thought I loved God, and now I can't pray. I don't, I don't know where God is. Huh? But God is doing that because he doesn't want us to rely just on our feelings, our consolations. See, that's why St. John of the Cross, who talks about the dark night, okay, he says we have to love the God of consolation and not simply the consolations of God. In other words, we don't want to love him just because it makes us feel good. We want to be good, okay? So in order to love him more, we have to learn to live not by our feelings, but by faith. And so what does God do? He withdraws his presence. Now, people will panic. Did I do something to offend God? But yet their conscience doesn't tell them that they've committed any serious sin, because that's the only way God would ever leave us. It's a mortal sin, okay? If there's no, you're not conscious of any mortal sin, you can be sure he didn't leave you, okay? So what happened? Well, he wants us to learn to strive for him and to persevere through our prayers because it becomes difficult to pray without that nice consolation, see? And people are tempted to give up prayer. Either they feel, well, where's God? He doesn't love me anymore, so why should I pray? I'm wasting my time. Or I can't pray anymore. You know, I'll do something good around a church or something like that. Well, there's nothing wrong doing something good around the church, but don't stop praying, see, because God will be back. That's a big temptation. St. John of the Cross says there's three signs by which a person can tell whether they're actually going through this dark night. You do often need a guide to help you. The first sign, he said, is you can't meditate. See, before you love to think about, like when you said the rosary, I was meditating all these mysteries. It was always beautiful, easy. I felt I got so much out of it. And all of a sudden now, I reached this point, I can't get two thoughts together. You know. Now, if you can't, if your mind doesn't work at any time, <laughs> I always tell people, you don't have a prayer problem, you have a mental problem. Okay? But if your mind works for, fine at any other time, but it, you can't pray in meditating, reflecting, okay, that could be one of the signs. Second, another sign is you don't have any more feelings about God, the consolation. But at the same time, and this is important, you don't want to go back to the world. I'm not being attracted by my old life of sin or any bad things. I don't want that anymore. I want Jesus. Okay. Okay. That's an important sign. I want him, but I can't feel him. Okay. And the third thing is, despite the fact that I have no feelings about God, I desire to love God with all my heart. So if you have those three, those three uh, experiences all at once, same time, can't meditate, all right, reflect. I don't have any more feelings because God took away that consolation. But I don't want to go back to the world, see, because if I was going back to sin, that would take my consolation away, see. And then I want to love God. Even the fact that I don't feel him anymore. Okay, what is God doing? You know, you ever hear the expression sometimes when a couple is courting and the lady wants to play hard to get. She makes it difficult for the guy hmm, to try to, you know, get her as his wife. <laughs> okay. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is doing. See, separation makes the heart grow fonder. Jesus goes into a way, he steps into the darkness where the person can't see them any, him anymore, but he's there. And he wants that person to search for them. And that's what happens. You know an example of that? The Blessed Mother in St. Joseph, when they lost a Christ child. 
in the, in the temple. Remember that? For three days. They were searching all over among the relatives and friends for three days. And finally, they went back to Jerusalem and found him in the temple. and were shocked. And even Mary said to him, Son, why did you do this to us? Didn't you know that your father and I, St. Joseph, would seek you in sorrow? But the Lord was, I think, showing us through Mary's experience that even she was searching for him. Okay? And um, that we too will have an experience of this. Later on, the apostles, okay, Holy Thursday night, when Jesus was seized, you know, and all their hopes for an earthly kingdom. Remember, they were still thinking that he was going to restore the kingdom of David on earth and Solomon and all. He wasn't. He was giving us the kingdom of heaven. See, and all those thoughts, all those desires were shattered because the Lord was taken away, hung on that cross. And imagine how guilty they felt. They ran away. Peter denied him. And yet he came back on Easter night, didn't he? Because when this dark night ends, it can go anywhere from six months to a year or two, St. Teresa said. Um, when you see the Lord after that, boy, your joy will be profound, just as the joy of the apostles was so great. Okay? And there's many other things we could say, but um, that gives you a little taste of what the dark night of the spiritual life is about. Okay, later on there's another dark night in which that might be more like Mary standing at the foot of the cross. Okay, and that happens for people who are very advanced in prayer. Okay, let me re close with, I'd like to use the prayer, um, the 23rd Psalm, okay, as our closing prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk in the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me with your rod and your staff to comfort me. You have prepared a table for, before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God love you. Bless you. Okay, well, we come to that part in our program now where we um, want to make our appeal for EWTN. You know, uh, Joan's question about darkness, I'm sure a lot of you can connect with some aspects of that struggle between the light and the darkness in your personal life, your family, and so on. But how will people hear this message? EWTN is the Catholic Church's greatest instrument to proclaim the new evangelization. Please help it to continue. And you do this by your prayers, your support, and financial support. Be as generous as you can. The Lord will reward you. Will You will be working for the new evangelization of the church. So God love you and bless you all.